Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidil anbiya'i wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yasirli amri Wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah with the blessings and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are continuing another week with our reminder and series of our hadiths from the 40 hadiths of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala and today we are going into the fifth hadith that Imam Nawawi rahimahullah recorded in his compilation and it's a hadith that I've highlighted at the beginning when we did our first hadith it is a hadith which, which scholars have mentioned that it is one of the three hadiths in which Islam and the matters of Islam revolves around. And the hadith is the meaning narrated by Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa raddun that whosoever introduces, whosoever invented something into these affairs of ours which is referring to Islam, the religion of Islam whosoever introduces into these affairs of ours something that does not belong to it, something that does not belong to Islam it is rejected. And this hadith is recorded by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim in both of the compilation. But in the compilation of Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala he says his wordings, the meaning is that whosoever works for something whosoever works a work which has which has for it no command of ours in Islam then it is rejected man amal man amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa raddun whosoever works something whosoever carries out an action that it is no command in Islam for it then it is rejected so like i've mentioned like at the beginning when we did the hadith the first hadith in al amalu bin niyat that fairly actions are according to one's intention this hadith also is one of the most important hadiths of Islam and Imam Nawawi rahimahullah made mention that it is also one hadith that everyone should try to memorize to one, everyone should try to have it in the memory that they can remember it on their fingertips and from the gist of the meaning of the hadith we, could, we can tell that this hadith it is used as a criterion for judging external action in regards to performing of ibadah, in regards to doing some acts of worship because carrying out of acts of worship if it's something which was not from Islam or if it is something which was not from the sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam, then it will be rejected so whichever action is not whichever action is not done according to sharia or according to the sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam, that action will be rejected and it will not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is from the basic text of this hadith <coughs> and in similarity with regards to the first hadith that we did in the mal'amalu bin niyat that verily action according to one intention in that regards the criteria for an action to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was that it must be sincerely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it has to come from the heart. So similarly, both goes hand in hand. You must carry out an action from the heart, but then outwardly also, the action must be according towards Sharia or according towards the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in regards to these two hadiths, scholars have pointed out and have picked out that there are two law or two conditions based on these two hadiths. The hadith number one, in Al Amalu Bin Niyat, actions according to one intention, and this hadith that whosoever does something which is not in our Sharia or is not in Islam, it will be rejected. They say there's two act, there's two action that is needed for the acceptance of ibadah, for the acceptance of worship. One of them being intention, niyyah. The action should only be done sincerely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, it should be done in accordance towards the Sharia or according to, in accordance towards the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So 
apart from hadith number one and hadith number five, say acceptance of an action can also be found in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Kaf, chapter 18, verse 10. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, sorry, chapter 18, Surah Kaf, verse 110. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, Man, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا That whosoever desires to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, then he should do righteous deed. And he should not ascribe anyone, he should not ascribe anything in partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there in the Quran, in verse 110, he reminds us that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone without ascribing partner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we do righteous action for our deeds to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we've mentioned from the beginning in the first hadith, that righteous action is is an action that is also done with sincerely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And emulating and following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a Quranic obligation which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ حُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That really in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the best example. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهُ وَلِمْ For you, those who desire to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment on the last day. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is another part. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, to say to them, O Muhammad, that if you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fattabi'uni, then you follow me, yuhbibkum Allah wa yakfir lakum thunubakum, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he loves you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive your sins. So, this hadith, we come to realize and we get from the chest of the hadith itself just by the mean of the hadith that it is compulsory that whatever action we do in regards to ibadat, in regards to worship or regards to Islam, it has to be in accordance to the Sharia, it has to be in accordance to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in accordance to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So from this hadith there is a very important concept we need to realize and we need to understand that the important concept in this hadith is following the sunnah it was regards to following the sunnah and not violate the sunnah and the practices of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because violating and, and going away from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will lead towards what is called bid'ah or innovation and scholars have classified the actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam into two types of actions one is that action which is done for the purpose of ibadah, for the purpose of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And two, such actions which are not done for that purpose, which is not done for the purpose of worshiping Allah, but it is action which is done due to customs or action which is done just haphazardly, etc. And regards to the matters of ibadah, how will you be able to differentiate? There are clear indicators which, for action which is done for sharia, which is done for ibadah, for worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in regards to commands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or the prohibition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, warning the companions or warning those around him. And as Muslim, which one of these two actions it is compulsory, it is compulsory or it is obligated upon us, it is only the first type of action of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which was done for the purpose of ibadah. Such actions are obligated upon a Muslim to follow and to follow in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And looking at it in a positive way, the actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in regards to ibadah, which should, be, which should be done according to sharia or according to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have to try and keep five aspects in mind, or try to keep five things in accordance to five things. And those five things are in accordance to the time. Uh, second is in, in accordance to the place. The third is that in accordance to the quantity and the amount that we done. The fourth is in accordance to the way in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa have done it. And the fifth is the type of action in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has carried out, the type of ibadah. And I will highlight these five aspects and these five aspects which we have to keep our actions, uh, keep in mind and keep our actions in check with the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that the first one that I've mentioned is that of time. Any ibadah that we do, it has to be done in its designated time or a specific time. For example, we know as Muslims we perform our five times daily salah. But if we were to look anywhere specifically in the Quran, 
there was no designated a specific time mentioned in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Akimis salat al idluk is shams ila ghasak al layl wa Quran al fajr. But in this, there's only two times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the time of the morning and the evening. But we know throughout the day we have the five times the salat each specific time. Each time of each salah was not mentioned here. But through the teaching from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which was passed down to him from Jibreel alayhi salam. Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taught that the time and the specific time, the beginning time and the ending of time for each salah. And that, for example, for our salah also, we have to perform our salah in accordance to those time. We cannot perform it out of the designated time. And the reason for this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also told us and taught us, reminded us in the Quran, Inna salata kanat ala mu'minina kitaba mawkuta. The very salah is on a specific and its appointed time and upon the believers. It is compulsory upon the believer on a specific time. And this specific time was shown to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another example, the month of Ramadan. The timing from the month of Ramadan, the beginning to the ending of the month of Ramadan, this fasting in the month of Ramadan, the time frame was also for us to be able to follow in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have to follow in according to the time frame which was set in Ramadan also in the fast of, for the fast of Ramadan. We cannot fast the fasting of Ramadan and expect to follow in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but we do the fast in the month of Rajab. Or in this current month that we are in, the Islamic month is that the month of Dhul Hijjah, um, Dhul Qarda, sorry, the month of Dhul Qarda, or in the following month, the month of Dhul Hijjah, which we know many times people go towards to performing the pilgrimage towards the Hajj. So those are not the months that we fast and expect to have this follow in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for fasting in the month of Ramadan. The second aspect is that of place, that Sharia has specified that a certain Certain ibadah, certain acts of worship have to be performed in the specific and designated places. For example, like I've mentioned, the following month, the month of Dhul Hijjah, the pilgrimage for Muslim, whoever wants to perform the pilgrimage, there is only a designated and specific place that you have to go and perform the pilgrimage. There is only a specific time frame also for that pilgrimage. Now, again, in regards to Aitikaf, we know in the month of Ramadan, there is seclusion that people keep themselves away from the dunya, from the outside world, from and devote himself solely for, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and building the connection and taqwa towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the designated place for that is it is done in the masjid. So these are aspects that we keep in place for following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another aspect of place also with regards to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he performs the salat al-jama'ah for men. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to recommend and commands the men, the male folks to go towards the masjid and perform the salah. So designated in following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also is that of a place, the masjid. The third is regards to the quantity. For most of the ibadah, most of the acts of worship in sharia, there is a specific number or a specific certain number of times that the action or the ibadah has to be carried out. For example, in praying our salah, there is a specific number of rakahs to be performed at the time of fajr salah. There is a specific number to be performed at the time of Aisha Salah. There is a specific number to be performed at the time of Asr Salah. So each number has a specific time. With regards to the Sajda, there is a specific number, there is a specific quantity to perform of Sajda. With regards to Salam, given Assalamu Alaikum on the right and Assalamu Alaikum on the left, there is a specific time. We don't give Salam three times, but we give the Salam two times. This quantity is also in, in accordance by following and sticking and sticking to this quantity. Which is Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is practice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we stay in align with it also, it will be as part of following the Sunnah and not violating and going something or inventing something extra in the ibadah which was not from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The fourth is that of the way, the tariqah, the method how, how, of how it was done. Every ibadah, every act of worship, was described to us or shown to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, when I say us, it is not you and I here as in person, but it was done and it was shown to the companions and those around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And subhanAllah, today, 1400 years after you and I are here and our lack of knowledge today, we are fighting and we, we are arguing and debating which one is correct or this one is was shown. We were, we did not see it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the beauty of Islam is such that you and I here today are able to practice Islam through the traditional way and the traditional teaching and methods that was passed down 
from generations after generation with students sitting under the scholars or students sitting under the teachers and knowledge was passed down from bosom to bosom from heart to heart with connection as we have learned when the hadith of Jibreel that we did the second hadith that Jibreel when he came to Rasulullah to teach the companions around him he came as a student but when he before when he said before he started asking a question how did he set with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the close connection that he said to show as a student must sit must sit with a teacher so subhanallah you and I today 1400 years after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the way and details of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in generation and scholars of all have recorded from centuries after centuries and it's here today that you and I practice him. So every act of ibadah was shown to us from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the best moral model for us to emulate Salatul Janaza. How do we know that Salatul Janaza has no ruku? That was shown to us from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That was taught to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When people go hajj, they, they throw stones at the jamarat. Then how do we know the amount of stones that is thrown at jamarat? How do we know the way the thrown the pebbles is thrown at jamarat? It was taught to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It was specified from by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and that is the way Muslims inshallah today up to today we have to follow. And before we perform any act of ibadah, we have to know how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we have to learn the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam perform that act. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned in the hadith when he said the famous hadith that Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli, that perform salah and pray as you've seen me pray my salah. The reason of this is that you have to follow the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam perform this act of ibadah. The fifth Aspects that we have to keep in consideration when following and sticking to the sunnah and not going out of the boundaries of the sunnah is that the type, the type of ibadah. The sh if the shari has a specific type of ibadah, then we should stick to that type. For example, the orhiya, which is coming up, as we refer to in other terms, korbani, the sacrifice that is coming up soon in the month of Dhul Hijjah. The type of animal that has to be sacrificed by sharia and was stipulated or it was shown by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what type of animal the specific the specific qualities of the animal and this shall not also not be violated because violation of this type again is going to take us out of the sunnah and it's an act of ibadah and violating it also will make us make it as a form of ibadah uh, of, of a form of innovation and a form of bid'ah which will also be render will also render our action as invalid and not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how we may say, yes, my intention is sincere. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows our intention and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to accept all our act of ibadah. But again, it needs to go hand in hand with regards to the sharia and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to us as a teacher. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, huwa alladhi ba'atha fil ummiyina rasoola. It is him who, who, it is him Allah who have sent a nabi amongst you to the people that he teaches them the Quran, he teaches them hikmah, he teaches them wisdom. Rasulullah came as a teacher for us that we have to follow and stick to his pathway which he taught us to, towards following the Sharia and the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as Muslims a clear distinction should be made about the actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whether they were only done from one time to another time or whether they were done continuously on a regular basis. For example, there are different nawafil salah that Rasulullah some will perform. Some he will perform continuously, some he will perform once off. For example, the sunnah of Fajr salah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will hardly miss it. Some scholars even mentioned that Rasulullah some probably missed it only once or twice in his entire life. So such actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we should try to emulate and we should try to follow as much more. And inshallah, every action that we do, we try to, whatever Sharia law we have to try and follow, we try to implement every act of Sharia, but according to the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And inshallah, inshallah, we hope that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will accept us and will help us that we can rectify our intentions solely for His pleasure and our outward action and according to the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In conclusion, that all of these hadith and a hadith that Imam Nawawi Rahimahullah have selected or have compiled are just more principles and criteria that helps the Muslims, that help you and I as Muslims practice easily. All these ahadiths, there's many scholars I've mentioned at the beginning and in the introduction when we started this series that many scholars have compiled ahadiths of 40 ahadiths. But Imam Nawawi 
compilation of 40 hadith was so special because of the hadith and the type of hadith that he compiled and he brought forward in this book. That it helps a Muslim to practice and stick towards principles. It helps a Muslim to fulfill his daily religious obligations and to fulfill himself spiritually. And similarly, the first hadith to until the swift hadith that we do doing today, we see every act in these hadith and every thing mentioned in these hadith is a, is a form of that, is a principle of Islam, is a criteria and is a it's an aspect that a Muslim can implement in their life and make our life better day by day. So inshallah, I pray and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that with this few reminder and with this short reminder that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us that we can bring this understanding into our life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help, help us that it can become easy for us to practice upon sharia, to practice upon the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned that the time will come when holding on to our Islam will be like that of holding on to hot charcoal, a hot burning charcoal. And we know as reality today is something that we cannot deny that you and I, we are seeing this reality facing upon us. But what is referring to at this time, the time when Rasulullah is referring to this is one of the time coming closer towards the day of Qiyamah. So as Muslim, we know we have to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let us now, before it's late, return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We emulate the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we become guiding stars and shining lights for not only for our home but for the community and each and every mankind and humanity at large. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.